I think we're pretty good. Do you want to start doing some intros, Nancy? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'll just encourage you guys to continue to just uh, throw things into the chat. Um, everyone can see it. And so if you have a best practice you want to share when you see something or a, a resource recommendation or a question you want to ask, what we're going to do at the end of this is we can transcribe and just collect all of this information, put together a comprehensive FAQ that we'll work in partnership with Nancy on and then deliver that as a, a web linkable piece that we can send out. Um, and, and so that we make sure that we don't like we might not answer every single question today, but we can we can certainly collect them and answer them after the fact. So um, so we'd love to have you guys participating with this as much as possible. And yes, I see a question there already about that. And we will anybody who registered will be sending out uh, a link with the, the recording and information afterwards. So that's a little housekeeping. But uh, before we get too much further along here, um, just like to do some introductions. So. Um, mine's real short, so I'll just get it out of the way. My name is Michael Peterson. I work at Procedure Flow um, and one of the, the first people in here and really enjoy doing knowledge management and how knowledge gets shared between humans without having to talk to each other. I'd say that's my main passion and that landed me into a product management position here at Procedure Flow. And so um, really love this company, love, love what you can do with Procedure Flow and happy to be here today hosting uh, this great presentation by Drum roll, please. Nancy Baker. And uh, so Nancy Baker is a great friend and uh, has used Procedure Flow prolifically and, and to great effect. And so uh, we're just so happy to have her with us today. And so Nancy, um, why don't you just give everybody, we know who you are, but why don't you give everybody else a sense of where you're from, um, how you got out west a little bit, you know, just some of that personal story. Um, what you do out there, who Cano is, um, and, you know, feel free to use your, your slides to show us pictures or, you know, just take us, take us to where, where home is, uh, which I think for you is kind of in two places. So. Um, yeah, it totally is in two places. So um, I actually, uh, I'm from, originally from New Brunswick and I kind of grew up, my career piece grew up uh, working in telecommunications. So I did, you know, lots of project management and business analyst work. And then we did the migration out to out west, out to uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta. So that's where, that's my second home. I actually have two homes. I have a home out west in Alberta and I have, um, I have a home here in New Brunswick. So for those who are from the States, how far, like what's the distance? Um, we're, so New Brunswick and Fort McMurray are about just over 5,000 kilometers away. So it's a good 13 hour plane uh, travel and it's a five day drive if you were driving between the two. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, so um, at Keanu, I actually, um, I work at Keanu as an organizational development advisor. And really my role there is to try and help and look at the organization and see how we can just work more effectively. So I help manage projects and helping to kind of create this framework for um, our process work and trying to raise kind of the maturity level of how we how we do this type of work and how we do continuous improvement. So that's kind of uh, me. And what I'm gonna go ahead and kind of just talk about what we're gonna cover today. And, you know, we can move around with this, but some of the things that I just wanted to kind of share with you guys today is, you know, who Keno College is and, you know, kind of where we are and, you can kind of put that in relation to kind of where you are and what organization or industry you're in. Um, some of our organizational pain and the things that keep us up at night. So I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. And our journey really of trying to build a continuous mindset. And I use the word journey because it really is a journey. It's not a, it's not a quick project that's over um, in six months. It is you have to have a journey mindset. Yeah, and if I um, pause you there for one sec, so just maybe help me understand your the way that you came in, Keanu. So um, your role, that you're almost like a full time continuous improvement. Uh, I'll say Lean Six Sigma for you know maybe my lack of uh, title knowledge, but like organizational development, project management, senior business analyst. Like um, if companies were trying to model, you know what you guys have been doing with Keanu. 
Um, what is what is, what are those role titles and what what is it exactly that you're allowed to do full time? Yeah, I think both of those. So definitely project management. I do manage projects. I am a PMP, okay. um, and I certainly do do business analyst work, but I also do and try and incorporate a lot of business change management. Okay. So we, you know, we weren't we we're not necessarily the most mature um, project management organization or the most mature process. Um, you know, management or framework type organization. So I'm really trying to try to bring those frameworks and that thought process and really doing good business change management and helping the organization accept changes mm -hmm. um, uh, as we go along. So those are the types of things I do, managing okay. projects, managing change um, and doing, you know, gathering requirements, trying to understand what the business needs Yep. And develop, um, you know, projects and strategies to help fill those gaps. And it's interesting, like, I think you'll talk about this more as we go through. And at some point here, I'll just button up and let you just cruise through the whole PowerPoint. But no, no, um, and keep keep interrupting. I want to set up the context just so people, maybe they don't have these roles internally and they need to sort of find the resourcing and the money to get them because you're going to share some of your ROI results, which are crazy. You know, the money that you can save by going through these exercises if you're new to that that space of continuous improvement and what you can do in a in a tool like Procedure Flow, but um, I think just just state up front from my perspective, like you have really kind of three types of industries. You have like that heavy manufacturing where you can see the inventory, like the boxes piling up and the trucks going, and it's much more visual, like to see where the bottlenecks are and all that kind of stuff. You have the services industry where you know you know Tim Hortons people line up outside of the building to get their coffee. And so you can still kind of, you can sort of see the Kanban of like activity that's going on around you in services or the wait line in the emergency room or whatever. Uh, but you're in the knowledge industry, right? And so the knowledge industry is super hard to apply these principles to because it's invisible. You don't see the emails piled up on, you know, Nancy's desk and all, all that kind of visual cue stuff disappears. And so you, you've got to set up this practice in, in an invisible land and, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of help people contextualize all of this around what you're doing because it's it's a it's it's almost like a new thing I think like where it's really it's hard to pin down in the knowledge industry and um, and uh, and so we'll we'll leave it at that. So well, why don't I, you? Yeah, yeah I think really kind of what we're doing is how we're using it. We are using procedure flow, and I'm going to go through this in a little bit, but we are using procedure flow. Um, in terms of customer service and how we're trying to use procedure flow from a customer service point of view, our customers are our students, mm -hmm. but we're also using procedure flow from an internal customer service point of view and trying to get that mindset within our organization that if I work in HR and I'm trying to get something from finance, I am their customer. Mm -hmm. So trying to use procedure flow in, in that context, right? And then the other types of ways we're trying to use procedure flow is just within the departments, maybe you don't have external customers or you're thinking of them that way, but we're using procedure flow to document the intellectual knowledge of what you have. And maybe it's something you do on a daily basis. Maybe it's something you do on a monthly basis, or maybe it's something you only have to do once a year and you can never remember how to do it. We're using procedure flow in that way. Awesome. So go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, what I've seen a little bit of your presentation. So I think there's a good opportunity break point here for me to just, I'll stop talking and then you just go through and do your thing. And then there's a certain point in there where we'll stop and we'll do a poll for everybody to participate in. Um, and so why don't you go ahead and just start to share your story? Yeah, so I'll just, you know, I'll kind of set the context, but that is us, um, Fort McMurray. We are, um, Keanu College is a small college set in Northern Canada. Um, we are set in the middle of the beautiful boreal forest. So I had to put, um, I had to put the little picture of the Northern Lights because we see oh, these beautiful. all the time. It's so beautiful. I've never One, seen it, but it just even the pictures, it's like, I just, I want to, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I always tell people who come and they say they have never seen the Northern Lights. I'm like, well, you have to go outside and look. You just have to go out and look and look up. Um, but one thing I do want to acknowledge is um, Keanu College is actually set on uh, no, Treaty Number Eight territory, which is the meeting places and gathering places of 
our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. So we are truly blessed to kind of share our college on their land. So I just want to kind of acknowledge that. And we've been, just to kind of set some context, we've been in um, operations since about 1965. So we're an older college, um, we kind of set in the heart of the community. We have, um, we do university programming, we do uh, a lot of apprenticeships because we are, the majority of our uh, economy is oil. Um, we do, you know, certificates, diplomas, and continuing education. We have about 2,000 unique students per year. So that just kind of sets up kind of who we are. But I really want to put it into perspective for you because really to get how far away we are, the closest Costco is about four and a half hours from us. So when you leave Fort McMurray, there is only one highway in and one highway out. Um, the closest gas station is about two and a half hours away. So yeah. just a little bit of context about how far we actually are from things. But we still have some of the, you know, the, you know, comforts of big city life because we, we do have lots of facilities and things like mm -hmm. that. So, um, and interestingly, we have, we're quite, um, a diverse um, community. We have people from all over the world, Fort yeah. McMurray is on a world stage. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Fort McMurray before, but um, you know, I think in Canada, most people in Canada know somebody who's living in Fort McMurray or has worked in Fort McMurray. So yeah, I think kind of the, it's the Canadian equivalent to the San Francisco gold rush of the 18, you know, yeah. or whatever. And, uh, all the mayor and timers went to work out in, at, you know, where, where they struck oil there. So that's the, I think that's, that's the story if you don't know it. Yeah. So the next couple of slides that I'm going to share with you kind of seem a bit extreme, but this is really kind of like my cause for why we need to document processes and why I'm, I'm trying to kind of help you understand how important it is to document what it is you do on a daily basis, because you never know what's going to happen or what comes around the corner. So it's just a, you know, a little, I just want to kind of paint this picture so you can kind of understand some of the root of our organizational pain. And, you know, some of you are probably feeling that now from COVID because you've been disrupted. Um, but I'll kind of share a little bit of what's happened with us. So just quickly, um, like I said, we primarily are an oil town. In 2014, oil prices like tank. They went from about $108 a barrel down to $39 a barrel. And at the time, we were like, oh my gosh, that's awful. But uh, little did we know, especially with COVID, that they were going to continue tanking. Like I th mm -hmm. think we might have been paying people to give our oil away in the last little bit. I'm not sure. So it, we'll it just got keep bad. going or whatever. <laughs> it got bad and then it got really bad. But the, you know, the trickle down effect or what happens from that is industry tightened its belt. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, from a college perspective, well, what did that mean to us? It means we had an, you know, decreasing enrollment, um, a decrease in incline, a decline in enrollment. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, uh, decreased funding from the government and things like that. So it really impacted us. And then, you know, Two years later, um, in 2016, we were hit with the wildfire. I didn't actually take this picture, but I was somewhere in this lineup. We had, um, I told you that we have one road in and one road out. Um, we had 88,000 people that all were, had to uh, evacuate from Fort McMurray in a matter of, you know, trying to in a matter of a few hours. And, um, all of our students, all of our faculty, staff, like our whole community, everybody evacuated. And we were evacuated for about five weeks before we were allowed to even come back to Fort McMurray. And just even the college, like trying to, to return people to the college, like we had staff that lost their homes. We had students that lost their homes. Everybody had friends that lost their homes. We had about 2000 structures, homes and, um, commercial properties that were burned, complete neighborhoods that were burned to the ground. So you guys are a tight know, community too, right? Like we, we are, and we are a fairly uh, small community, um, but we were just like so unprepared for a disaster of this magnitude. Our college didn't actually burn down, but we certainly did 
have quite a bit of damage done to um, the property. But I guess the, the big impact to our business is, and, and the thing that I kind of want you to get from this, is that we still needed to do things. We still needed to operate. We still needed to talk to our students. We needed to talk to our staff. We needed to still needed to make payroll. We still yeah. needed to get a student a transcript. So there were things that we had to still do during this all of this devastation. And it's way better when you have this stuff documented and documented in a way that you can access it when you need it. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in the middle of a something as tragic as this, you don't want to be thinking about things. You want to just be able to, to do. And we were scattered all over the province, some all over the country. Um, so it was a lot. It, it was it was a lot to kind of um, really kind of like get back from. Yeah, um, yeah. it was like your little like almost a preparation as well for the pandemic in the sense you know you 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 guys might have had a little bit of a lead on understanding remote work a bit better and impact of that. So this is your first you know business continuity encounter. It was our first business continuity encounter. It really made us realize how much we needed to have business continuity plans documented, but just, just our business processes documented. And um, I know we're gonna do a poll here, but I guess one thing I would just say is because people kind of get, you know, they don't really understand what you mean sometimes when you say business processes. And to me, a business process is anything that we need to do in our business to do our jobs or our function. So it could be interacting with a customer, another employee or coworker, how you interact with a tool or a system. It could be any of those things. So I just use that word and give that description because sometimes people think that a business process is maybe just something with a tool, but it's it's anything that you need to do to do your job function, really. And I don't know if you have a better description, Micah, but... No, I mean, I think, I think that's fair. It's like I said, it's for me, it's human knowledge sharing without talking to somebody. And so that takes many different forms, um, but how effective can you be doing that? And uh, mm -hmm. I think we all have sort of a normal grid for what documentation looks like. And then, then the, the effectiveness question is kind of like where I like to play with it, the definition a little bit, but um, to your point, we can launch the poll here as you, and maybe you can just sort of transition to the next slide. And as the results come in, we'll share them. But um, you're going to talk a little bit, I think, about what percentage of your processes you had documented going into this. I'll launch this poll right now. So for everybody watching, if you want to just participate in this and uh, let us know basically how much you think um, your, your, your currently, your processes are, are documented. And if you want to be super honest and transparent with that, maybe saying, and and they're usable and effective, not just documented, like how confident. So why don't you go ahead, Nancy, and just sort of um, share this part of your presentation. Well, it's interesting because if you'd have asked me that five, four or five years ago, I don't think I would have actually really had any idea. I wouldn't have known how to answer that. Like many people probably just don't know, but um we learned a lot kind of from this experience. And one of the things that we did when we came back and after things kind of normalized from the fire is we did this business impact assessment. And really what we did is we just went out to every department in the college and said, tell us some stuff. We wanted to know what your business processes were, which ones were critical, when did you do them, what technologies were involved. But one of the last questions we asked them when we were going through this exercise with them is are your processes documented partially documented or not documented at all. And what we learned was that less than 20% of our processes were documented. Okay. So this is interesting. So we've got our results here and it looks like most people think that they fall perhaps within, well, seven and eight. So somewhere between 20 and 60% is what people are feeling right now. Um, and so that's, but, but there's lots of other answers here as well. We've got five people that would say it's 20% or less sort of in the same boat that you were thinking. Um, and then some folks that are much, much higher on that scale. Um, maybe a few Keanu employees, who knows? <laughs> Closest. Um, the interesting thing that we found as we kind of went and did more of that though, 
is of the processes that we had documented, they were not documented very well. Like they might have said some of the things that you had to do, but they didn't tell you, they didn't go into how to do it. And you right. kind of brought up that knowing, like that being able to know. And that was the big, one of the big issues is poor kind of knowledge transfer, right? So if you, if you manage an area, and, and this is a question I always have for people in, in my organization is if you manage an area and you lost people, you, you lost an employee tomorrow, would you be able to step in and fill in that role? Would you know how to run the report or would you know how to interface with the system? Because the reality of some of the stuff that we were faced with is losing all of that knowledge and intellectual property. Some of the people from the fire never came back. Right. Um, some of the issues that we were having from um, you know, the economy is that we were having churn. We were not, you know, we were losing employees. Right. And when you lose employees, especially if they've been there for a long time, you're losing all of the, in, you know, institutional knowledge. And that knowledge is just goes out the door. So, yeah. you know, this is really kind of where our mapping journey began. And we didn't have procedure flow at the time, but this is where the concept came to us. It's like, we need something where we can document our processes that it makes it really easy to do. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be a business analyst to do this. So I'm like, I wanna be like the network marketing person of processes where you can duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. I want it to be so that it's simple for anybody to be able to do it. And that's, that's a key thing because we actually went out and did an RFP and I looked at lots of different tools but you needed somebody who had senior business analyst skills. They had to know how to write SOP, standard operating procedures or PIDs and things like that. And that wasn't gonna work in our organization. And I think many organizations now that are you know, small to medium-sized organizations, those types of tools, like the bigger, heftier tools just do not work in, in the same way that we were looking for. So this is kind of like how it, it started for us. Okay. And I'll, I'll say, as you go to the next slide, one of our, I know Adrian and myself, when we started building procedure flow, one of our heartbeat things was we wanted it to be a layman tool. We wanted it to be something that was approachable. And so like, for instance, we had to consider, do we do BPMN, which is like business process modeling notation. I'm and so glad you didn't. <laughs> didn't because there was seven different decision diamonds with these weird icons and nobody knew what they meant. And we were just like, Eh, if people don't know what they mean, we, you know, if you're explaining, you're losing. So we, that was, you know, part of the design there as well. I'll tell you, and this is, I, I shouldn't maybe be this honest, but I mean, we've had process issues, I'm sure for a long time. And I actually found a binder that we had paid um, somebody to like a consultant to come in and do some process work for us in our finance area. And there were all these beautiful videos of these processes, but one, nobody knew where they were. Um, nobody knew what to do with them and we spent a lot of money to do this work, but the, our people need to be able to do this work. Yeah. And that was the big thing for us. So I make this joke that we were like the process wild, wild west, but that's really what it was. We had, you know, we found our employees have processes documented everywhere. So they were uh, in Word, they were in OneNote, they were in people's, you know, the hard covered, you know, notebooks that you carry around from meeting to meeting. I've actually seen people like transfer when they're moving from one position to another, like hand over their notebooks. Yeah. They were on our network drive, like our Q drive. They were in all kinds of different places. And so people think they had processes documented, but when you have an extreme of when you need to access those processes, who knows where to get them? Like you have to train people just to figure out where to get the processes. 100%. Um, so and employees, our employees didn't really have the right tools to, or knowledge on how to document. But sure. the other, my favorite one too, is the sticky note phenomenon. So we had business processes on sticky notes. And I'm sure if, if any of you guys have seen this, um, and I'm sure you have, you just don't maybe know that it's a business process, but they were stuck on the backs of people's cubicles on their uh, computers. And it was telling them that they had to do a certain thing or go to a certain URL. And those were literally business processes. So we had, you know, people who had binders of manuals and things like that, that were business processes. So, um, like I said, they, 
they were kind of getting some of those things were getting at the maybe what you needed to do, but it mm -hmm. really didn't get into the how could somebody sit in that role right. or sit in that job and know what to do and yeah. the answer was definitely no. So we really needed a an easier approach to be able to do that. Yeah. So I'll just share a little bit of our organizational pain. Um, I'm, I mean, we had lots, but I'm just going to kind of share a few with you because some of these might, uh, if, you know, resonate with you. I say I use the word students, but to me, students are our customers. Okay. Sure. So our students would go into the office of the registrar, and they would get a different answer every time, if depending on who they asked. So they would you know, call or go into the office of the registrar and they would get a different answer based on who they got. And, you know, maybe that person had more knowledge than somebody else. Sure. Um, it took maybe a full academic cycle. If you had a new person come into the office of the registrar, it'd take a full year almost to get that person really trained until they've seen every scenario. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, you th if you think about how you train somebody, you bring them in for a couple of weeks, you do some training with them. And then, you know, you're not going to stay with them for, for a year, but some of the stuff that they see, they're only seeing six months from now or eight months from now. And so some of the things that we found is that, and I, when I say we, I do this with my husband too. I use the collective we when, I mean, like we gotta, we gotta fix the car. I mean him, our team is the we, but the, these long training times and, and now what they're found, what they have found since they've documented in procedure flow is they can train um, somebody to kind of sit in the, at the, that front desk and they can train them, take them through everything, but now they have the support of procedure flow. So the way they're using it in this scenario um, with you know, a, a frontline kind of rep is they have procedure flow up and they have their student information system up. And yeah. so you know, when a, a student comes in and they're looking for a certain scenario, they go to procedure flow and look up the scenario and then they go to the student information system. They either answer the you know, student or they go and do whatever they need to do. So, the training times really shrunk from it taking really a whole year to just a few weeks because really once you train them, then they just needed to know where to go find it in procedure flow and they could follow it, right? So that was one big thing. Um, another big loss for us, and I, I just talked about this, was the loss of our institutional knowledge. And it wasn't just in our office of the registrar. This was in IT. This was in our advancement team. This was all over the place. When you have somebody who knows how to do something really well uh, and they're gone, you, you lose all of that. Yeah. And it really did feed into low employee morale because our employees would say, nothing ever changes. You can't ever make anything better here. So they didn't have a mechanism or a way to make a recommended change or to fix something. Right. And they certainly had no desire to document because it just seems so overwhelming. So yeah, those were some of the pain points that we were trying to deal with. When you, when you mentioned that, like, there's something when you feel helpless, it's depressing, right? And mm -hmm. then if you feel like you can help to make it better in some way, um, then it's energizing. And so, what, you know, one of the things I like about your story is just the idea that um, this work that you're doing is an energizing work um, that it does, it brings morale and it, it bolsters the company, uh, the organization. And so um, there's, it's not just like a drudgery, you know what I mean? Like documentation is not about sort of this, this drudgery of documenting what we do, but it's about seeing what you do, sharing it, and then making it better. And then that brings people to life as they feel like they have more power to, to, to affect the processes. It's really true. Um, I use this example of the line when I'm talking with people, you know, I'm still, you know, we're using this throughout our organization, but there's still, you know, we're still doing business change on using procedure flow. We have some teams that are really engaged and other teams that we're still working with. But if this line is status quo, um, every time we lose an employee and we lose all of their institutional or organizational knowledge, we fall below the line. Every time we have a process that's broken, that we're not working as efficiently as we should be, we're falling below the line. Mm -hmm. We have departments that are butting heads when the flow of information is not going the right way, we're, you know, we're below the line. And really where we want to be is we want to be above that line. We want to be aspirational and innovative and we want to be exceptional. And how do you get up there? It's like, just at least get to the darn line, right? Get to the line and stay 
at least stay at that line so you can move above the line. Because every time we start inching up and we feel like we're doing a great job and then something happens, you know, and not even to mention some of the massive things that have happened to us, we fall fallen below the line. Mm. So the more we can document, um, because once we get to the line and as we're documenting stuff, now we're starting to improve things. And so that's, yeah. you know, that's kind of like status quo for me. Something I, I learned along the way too, when I was doing my continuous improvement learning education was that um, while it seems daunting to become that proactive company, that's like being proactive on your customer's behalf versus being reactive. Um, it seems daunting, but the, what the, the, the instructor said was, you only need like a 2% difference edge on your competitors to blow your competitors out of the water. Um, and not that you want to necessarily blow everybody out of the water, but just the, the idea that, you know, to be a really successful company, you only have to be incrementally better than everybody else for people to take notice. Um, like the, the bar is pretty low, I guess. <laughs> so, um, you know, anything you can do helps versus thinking that you have to do everything, I guess. It seems like a really daunt, daunting task, but I'll show you when we pop over into procedure flow, really kind of just how we started this. And our business change management approach. So if you're somebody who is looking to bring procedure flow in, maybe you're looking at it just for your own department, um, which is what we did with the office of the registrar first. And when we got it into the office of the registrar and other people started seeing what we were doing, all of a sudden people were poking in and saying, hey, I want that. I, I want that. Can you come do that? Can we have that? Um, so you can start small. And the reason we started in the office of the registrar was a couple of things. One, we had a leader and a manager who knew that we needed to do this kind of work and they were right. on board. Um, so so my, my advice is, is to start in an area where that team or that, that leader is ready to do like this kind of change. And it kind of just really grew from there. Like um, Candace Crosley is our one of our managers in the office of the registrar. And I'm gonna quote her because she has said this before. She said procedure flow for them has been game changing, um, that it has really changed a lot in the way that they manage things. So even during COVID, you know, they've documented their processes, but during COVID, you know, we were spread out um, and, and she had her team spread out and she was still able to like the changes that they made, had to make for COVID. She was able to communicate those so much easier mm. to her frontline staff. So, you know, Candace uh, is actually on the chat saying hi to you. And she oh. said she's updating flows as she's watching the web. <laughs> See, awesome. Thanks, Candace. Um, and, and the other cool thing is, is that with her team, uh, and I can kind of show this, is that they're all adding to the improvement of those flows because they all have the power to do that. And, and Candace can look at them and say, yeah, we're going to make that change or not. Or when they find a mistake, they can do that. So I'll just quickly go through this, but, you know, I showed you a picture of the fire um, in 2016 and our motto is not, you know, not if another business interruption comes, it's when. Right. And so this spring, just after we were all sent home with COVID, we had a massive spring flood in Fort McMurray. And you can see this is actually our downtown core. Our college actually, which is not in this picture, but our college has seen $50 million in damage. Crazy. And uh, yeah, I actually almost get a little teary just thinking about it because, you know, it's, we've had to be so resilient. Yeah. Um, and it seems like so extreme, but luckily for us, we had already started our procedure flow journey. So during this time, you know, we had lots of employees that were kind of in this lull where they didn't really have a lot to do because we were all you know home obviously and so my microsoft team started blowing up like people were like can i can i use procedure flow can i use procedure flow and so they spent a lot of time documenting um things so one of the things i would say is like in times of turmoil you really want to have your stuff documented because it just will make the transition to the next phase you know like during this this is obviously we're in crisis mode um, but eventually things start to normalize and you, you just need to have things documented so that you can go through that, those transitions so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to pop out uh, to procedure flow for a second and I'm going to break up uh, Candace's area. But what I just wanted to show you here is entry points to me are pretty much 
equate to a different department. So you can see, like we are starting to use procedure flow throughout all kinds of different departments in our college. And they're all, at all different levels of starting this journey. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna kind of focus on the office of the registrar. And one thing I will just show you, because Mike, Mike, we were just looking at this before, which I'll pop into the office of the registrar. Um, is that you can see, see up here, see this change history? There's 61 yep. new changes. This is how um, Candace and her team are just continuing to make these processes better. So one of the things that I would just show you here in um, the Office of the Registrar, this is where we started. And the very first thing we did, because you know, when, as I start to click through some of these, you're gonna be like, oh, this is so much. But it really wasn't, we really kind of just went step by step by step by step for Candace's team. The very first thing we did is just say, what are the high level things that we do? And that's how these boxes appeared. Like, what are the yep. functions that we do? And so these came up, you know, registration, we do admissions, we do mm -hmm. records management. And then, you know, then we'd make the next list. Um, and before I click in registration, one of the things I kind of just want to bring your eye to is that you don't have to go click through all the way. You can save favorites over here. So if there's processes that you use, like on a regular basis, you can kind of right. have little favorites to the side. But what this replaced, this replaced a binder that was on everybody's desk that probably was different because nobody had all the same updates. It right. replaced the email that you had to remember from six months ago that, oh yeah, we do that different now. It replaced the sticky notes. It replaced um, the things that were in OneNote and the processes that were on the Q drive. Now it's all here. So you don't have to wonder where to go get it. You just need to know that you're going to procedure flow. So I'm just going to use registration as an example. If you click on okay. registration, there are so many processes that the Office of the Registrar have to do. They have so many complex processes. Yeah. They're ever-changing. They work with so many different institutions. There are so many things. And so what they did is they kind of just laid out the next level. Like, well, what do I have to do? Am I registering for a credit course or non-credit course? Yep. Is this a tuition waiver? Um, is it the apprenticeship program? What do I have to do? And and they just kind of click to the next thing. If you're somebody who is doing a lot of registration for uh, apprenticeship programs, you would probably have that saved as a favorite up here. And then what am I doing in apprenticeship programs? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the registration for them. And we take them right through from the beginning to the end of what it is they need to do to actually register an apprentice. And the thing that I love about this is we do these little backstories that just kind of, so every, we're, we're coaching people, you know, a little backstory so that people know when they come into this process, what are they doing here? It just gives yeah. them kind of some, it yeah. orientates them to context to what this is. Yeah. So this is just we, kind on of our, on a lot of our mapping projects, what we find, what I've found to be true is that actually the context, the backstory can actually be half the battle. Because like mm -hmm. you have a process and people can see that's laid out like how to do it, but they don't know why they're doing it or why it's so weird or is it some legacy thing and we can't make it go away. And so they have a lot of questions. And so if you can capture those and, and sprinkle them throughout, it gives somebody that, that full understanding of not just what they're doing, but why they're doing it as well. And so it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a really important thing to do, yeah. We've experienced the same thing um, where people couldn't, couldn't fill in that purple box first. And uh, so they've struggled with that. But as we just kind of go through the flow, we just keep adding to that story. Like, why are you in here? Why are you doing this? And in some cases, some process, we're like, why are we doing this process? <laughs> what, does that even no. make sense anymore? Continuous we, improvement. We get such a, we, we didn't actually, I, I will admit, like we didn't start doing this from a continuous improvement mindset. It was out in the future. We started this with, let's document what we have. We are evolving to this continuous improvement mindset now. And that's, you know, some of the things that we're finding, um, I'm just gonna give you an example um, you know, in, in our payroll, for instance, we were still using paper timesheets. We knew that it probably was not very efficient to use paper timesheets, but could we make a business case or make a case for why we should not use paper yeah. timesheets? We couldn't until one day I sat down and did a flow like this with, um, Candace, who was in our, um, trades department. She was one of the admins there. And as we went through the flow and put down all of the stuff that she did to process one timesheet. Yeah. And, and I mean, from the time 
She printed it off, filled it in, gave it to somebody to sign, gave it to somebody else to sign, made a photocopy of it, scanned it, filed it in this book and in this drawer. And then that person filed it somewhere all before it even got to payroll. And then they had to do five things with it. When we look after, like you get to see the, the craziness and the silliness in the processes yeah. that you do very, cause it's so visual. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've got a slide further on, but I'll just tell you guys, when we did that project, we found $450,000 in annual savings just from that one. Say that, say that again, it's just it's a crazy number. $450,000. And I think we were actually really conservative in that right. number because all we did is we looked at that flow and we saw how many times it was touched by somebody. We could calculate, we knew how much it costs to do a scan and a, a photocopy for each one of them. We have hard costs there, Yeah, but we just put like, five minutes to each person who touched this thing, which it was probably in some cases more. Plus then they walked those paper timesheets down to HR. Cool. And it, it was just amazing when we did it. So we're using the same process now. Uh, we're looking at like how we do employee files, how we do uh, student files. So we're gonna be looking at all of those types of things as well. One and more thing that I wanna show you. Yeah, bring that up. I just, while you're doing that, I just wanna go back to one thing we talked about at the beginning. Or actually kind of two things and like I just want people to understand the power of this like the, the first one of the first things I said was that when, when you're in a knowledge industry what I mean if you're in manufacturing or services you're probably already doing some level of Lean Six Sigma you know anyway right uh, eliminating waste essentially but like when you're in the knowledge industry if you can't see it you can't fix it it's like budgeting it's like tracking your eating right you're all of a sudden you ate two cookies and if you don't track that you know, you just, your brain forgets about it. Right. And so mm -hmm. it, and so the, if you can see it, you can fix it. And, and that, then you can justify the resourcing, like hiring somebody like Nancy into your organization to, to do more of this stuff. And so that it, it, it's a virtuous circle that builds on itself. Um, and, it, and then takes you from a reactive position to a proactive position. And it's, it's powerful. And I just, like, it's so crazy. Like, $400,000 plus savings and annual on just visualizing a single thing that you've done in one department. And that's the power, the power of that. So, yeah. So what's this one here? Well, the, the thing is, is just to finish on that point, the thing is, is that sometimes in, in your, your work life, you're like, something just doesn't work right, but mm -hmm. you can never really put your finger on it. What it is, what happens is, is when we do the flow, then we can like Put our fingers all over it we can say yeah. this this and this so this is just one other way that we are using procedure flow so i showed you the office of the register and that's how a department is using and documenting the functions or the things that they do but the other thing we've done is we have an employee internet um and there's forums and things like that that you have to do out there maybe for it or for onboarding or, or different things but what what we were finding is, is people didn't really know what to do with those. So we're really wrapping procedure flow kind of around that internal, those internal processes. Because if you think about what some of these areas do, like finance, HR, IT, the library, health services, they are basically service areas for the college. So their customers are other people in the college. Sometimes they're external, but for the most part. So we need to think about it in the same term. So if you go you know, if I'm a new employee, or even if I've been an employee here for a while, and I want to go and settle my corporate P card, I can click into finance and say, you know, here's my, how do I settle my corporate credit card? And not only do we just show them the steps very easily, if these are the things that you need to do, we show them how, like you can click on it and we show them exactly how to do it. Yep. So the training time of trying to, and we haven't even captured this into a context of dollars, but the training time for new managers or managers who are maybe doing it wrong, which is causing errors in finance. This is the other thing, um, you know, one of the, you know, some of the common things that I've heard like throughout the organization is like, oh, they never bring it to us right. And they never do it right. And so I'm trying to use this notion of if they're not doing it right, it's not because they don't want to, it's because they don't know how. Yeah. So we need to make it really clear for them, then teach them how to do it. And if they're still doing it wrong, we need to look, maybe the flow isn't right, or then maybe we have some type of issue with an employee. But for 99% for of the time, it's because they don't know how. Right. So this is what this common employee process area is trying to fix, is that we can take people through and show them exactly how we want them to enter their time 
exactly how we want them to fill in for their benefits. Yeah. And if you want to, you can put in screenshots, you can click them through exactly what they need to so do. So good. So You've done such a great job, you know, interdepartmentally, like it's just, this is amazing to see. And um, just before you leave this and, and finish up, and we do want to take some questions as well. I know we're starting to run out of time, but um, the, can you just show them quickly, go to draft edit just to, cause we talked about how it's laminized and it's easy. So just show them the canvas for one second, just so they can understand. That yeah, sure. So if I wanted to make a change to this, all you do is take a draft, which is just like taking a photocopy of the processes out that are kind of like in, in published and then you click on edit. And so you get this canvas and then all you do is you just pull your boxes down. So okay. you know, make a change and you can add it and then you can just save it and then um, show them the review uh up there the review changes and so we side by side compare it as well so you can see the green highlight on the before and after so that it makes it really easy for the approvers to review the suggestions coming in and then for the people who are being notified of the changes they get the same view there as well and so i just wanted people to to be able to see that in your presentation too and the interesting thing is, is then somebody like Candace, who's a manager with a bunch of different employees who are recommending changes, she can, she can approve the draft or she can delete the, the draft. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just going back to your presentation there, maybe in 30 to 60 seconds, just sort of take us out in terms of your results. Um, and then we'll, if people want to start loading up questions into the chat, um, feel free to do that. And then Nancy and I would love to, to um, take those questions. I think the bottom line is, is this is really um, what we're finding is it's transforming the way we're doing continuous improvement now. So we are moving into a continuous improvement mindset because now we have we have tools to do it. And it's so easy that, you know, my my whole thing is always about working myself out of a job. I want I want you to be able to do what it is that I do so that you need me less. And the thing that we found is, you know, when we first started, Procedure flow came in and helped us for a while. The way I'm using from a business change point of view is I go into departments and help them for a little bit. And then they get a couple of key people in their departments and then they're doing the mapping. It's so simple. It's really not hard, but it really has kind of changed. Um, we were going from just documenting stuff now to documenting stuff and looking at it and saying, how can we make this better? So we actually are using a Kanban board of um, we've got a backlog of processes that we know are either not working well or are broken okay. that we're now creating projects to say, okay, let's go fix this process. Cool. We never would have been there two years ago. So Cindy Haynes McDonald is asking, unsure of the audience, but I'm sorry, I might be jumping ahead. Was that- no, do you, um, <laughs> we're, for, we're at the right spot, um, my apologies. So Cindy was saying, um, I'm interested in being walked through the pages with processes from student contact to application and admissions. Um, might need a little more clarification on that one, Cindy. Interested in I would say um, just to answer that a little bit. Cindy, oh, I would, like in practice, yeah. I would say right now, um, one of the things that I'm hoping that we will get to in the future is mapping the student journey. We haven't done that yet. We've done more of in each department. So in admissions, right. here's the flow in admissions. This is how they do applications in registration. This is how they do registration. And there's there's hundreds of different flows in there. Um, the whole it is kind of like an ideal to do the whole student journey as a, um, a mapping exercise to see what the student actually goes through. We haven't done we haven't done that mapping yet. Yeah, and what we call that is tier five. Tier five is kind of like the the materials, like screenshots and things that you need to do the job, job aids and things like that, which can be in procedure flow, obviously, and it fits really well in there. Tier four is the organization of those processes, which Procedure Flow does really well. Tier three is how departments talk to each other interdepartmentally. Um, and then those are typically swim lanes, which you can do in Procedure Flow as well. So you can create a really nice linked view from how organizations work and talk to each other 
great down to have somebody's doing the job there as well. Um, Cindy, we'll come back. I'll, I'll connect you with Nancy and, and we'll get a little bit more clarity on, on that question. Um, Kristen says, Nancy, I saw a section for facilities. Can you talk about how your facilities group is using procedure flow? Yeah, we have just started in our facilities group. Um, we're working with housing right now to actually document the COVID uh, changes that they're using in, um, in our residents. Um, some of the flows that we are starting in in facilities are things like how do you you know how do you rent a car how do you get key requests things like that mm -hmm. um so we're just starting to document some of those security also fits under our facilities uh realm um so we're definitely doing things like what to do in the event of a fire alarm what to do in the event of um uh you know a lockdown and, and or holding secure or lockdown so we're doing lots of different things. We haven't used it in facilities yet in terms of maintenance. Um, more on how you interact with facilities is kind of where we've started. Okay. Um, and we'll, again, we'll collect all of these and let Nancy go gangbusters on answering all of these questions. But I think I'll go back to Cindy for a second. She, I think she's talking about admissions. So do, do you have application for this, uh, say to ad admissions? Yeah, we show the actual application process. So there's, because our, we have many kind of different ways that it can come into an application process. So we have, you know, we have a paper application and depending on what it is we're registering them for, they're applying for, it can go through a different flow. Um, we also have um, APAS is um, Alberta's, um, it's how we do uh, applications online. So we kind of show it uh, to the point where it goes through APAS and APAS does their thing and then it gets passed back to us. Um, but you easily, whatever your processes are in admissions, you can easily uh, map the flow for that. Right. Awesome. Um, Kevin has an interesting change management question. Um, have you experienced any challenges in getting employees, specifically more tenured staff, to adopt PF? If so, what strategies have you implemented to improve adoption? Yeah. So you need to really start in one area so that people can see it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as you get kind of those early adopters in and using it, it, it's kind of one of those things where other people have just fallen in line. You're always gonna have some people are gonna completely resist the change. But the other thing is I've kind of taken two approaches. I started kind of on, you know, on the level of employees like I found people who were on the ground, frontline employees, really saw this quickly and how much it could benefit them. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them first, worked with some managers. Some senior management didn't really get it. So mm -hmm. we've been kind of like working up the organization, but we've also been working, you know, down, working with, um, you know, trying to really get our executive to really buy in to procedure flow. And now that people are able to see it more, um, we're getting more and more buy in. One, one key thing is, is we are rolling out that common process area that I showed you where we are interacting with departments. We are formally rolling that out um, this month and we'll get, um, I think, a much larger adoption like across the board with our faculty and things like that as right. they start to go in and use it for certain things. Awesome. We're awesome. actually starting to hear people say, did you put it in procedure flow? Oh, nice. Yeah. There's little key things like that, right? When you start to hear those things, you know the change is starting to be adopted. That's awesome. Um, so I, I would echo you, you know, from my experience, say, get a quick win in. That's like a Lean Six Sigma thing. It's like show people that it works. So find that group that's already wants to do it and do it with them. Executive sponsorship, if you can get it, is massive. So anytime you can get executive sponsorship. And then maybe just as a sub bullet on that point, there's a one of my favorite books for change management is the My Iceberg, our ice, Iceberg is Melting, Our Iceberg is Melting by, um, it's a John Cotter book, I think, and it goes through the eight principles of leading change. And the, probably the, you know, the most important part of that is helping to shape for the people who are resisting change, like why it's important to say the students or, you know, your internal customer, like how does this help the organization holistically and giving them it's not just about moving their cheese, but it's about, you know, 
um, helping them understand how it benefits the, the the end customer and makes it their life better. So um, that I would definitely, it's a short book. You can read it in like 45 minutes. It's really fun. Um, Kevin said, I liked your PF layout. Was this your initial design or is it something that just evolved? It was, it just evolved. It was our initial design. We've moved some things around, but um, yeah, this is kind of where we started and just kept going with it. We've had other flows that we've moved around, but um, this has been working for us so far. Awesome. Um, I know people are gonna have to start jumping for other calls. I'm just gonna, there's lots of questions, so I'm just gonna go through them. We'll capture them and just make them part of the video delivery. So if you have to take off, don't feel bad about that. Um, peace out to Scott there, who said, thanks so much for the content. Um, and, uh, and just, yeah, if you have to drop for another meeting, go for it. And we'll just, we'll keep rattling through these. So. Um, Stephanie said, is there a place where we can take a tour of an example procedure flow? Um, I'll, I'll take that one maybe. And with, uh, I'll, I'll make maybe a future promise here as well that, uh, we have, if you sign up for a trial of procedure flow, um, you'll just have a quick little chat with a uh, discovery call with one of our sales folks, and then they'll give you access to an environment to trial it. There's samples in there. So right now we have about five different samples that you can just pop in, kind of see how they're laid out. Um, you're always going to be customizing it to what you're doing. And so at some point, you'll just have to jump in and start customizing stuff. But um, there's a couple of different flavors of examples. And then I was I was thinking as we were going through this, I'm like, Nancy, we need to just template everything you've done. <laughs> and it's just like, you just click, yeah, I need this, 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 and this, and then bang, just go. So um, that probably will say that's coming soon. And we'll I will I will say it's like any other, okay, if you've done process work in the past, where do you start? You do a process survey. Remember how I, I talked about um, in the office of the registrar, we just said, what are the big buckets of things that you do? And sometimes we had little bucket things on our main page. And, and as we just went through, we kind of just, it's so easy to move things around, but we just started with those, that process survey, those big bucket things, what do we do? And we just kept going down layer mm -hmm. by layer from there. And the other cool thing about this is, is in my old life, if I did a process, if I did a set of processes with somebody, I was doing it on a wall or, um, you know, with sticky notes and things like mm -hmm. that. And we would go through these like long process things, and then you'd have to transcribe it and you'd all have to get back together. And it took forever. The cool thing about this, it's like, we do sprints. Like I'm working with the uh, procurement right now and we've booked, you know, she only has an hour a week. We book an hour a week and we actually work in procedure for, for an hour. When we leave that hour, the work she's done is done. And so sometimes in some groups, we sprint for three hours every two weeks. Yep. Once the work is there, it's done. Yep. And uh, it's the coolest thing. It just, we just keep moving forward. As awesome. long as you just set some time aside to do this work, it just continues to get done. Yeah, I agree. And my experience has been also that we can map most of the content in half the time it takes to train a class. So if you were training all the materials in class, basically the mapping time would be half that. So it's not actually that daunting. And additionally, I would say apply the Pareto rule. So wherever you're having the most challenges, the most turnover, the most pain, uh, the most volume, hit those places up first, and then you can always tackle all the other stuff later. Yeah. One last question, and then we'll we'll turn the tap off here and, and say thank you. So uh, somebody mentioned, how long did it take you to get the procedure flow implemented with Cano College? And I am... Um, I understand it is a continuous process, but can you give them an idea of just the, to some degree to get up and running, you know, can you give them a, a couple of different flavors there of what that looked like for you? Yeah, sure. Uh, we started, uh, I think it's a year ago now. Time goes by. It's kind of like, was that six months ago or three yeah. years ago? <laughs> but we started about a year ago and, and we started, um, the very first process we did was our scheduling management. And the reason we did that is it's very complex. There's multiple systems and we only had one person who knows how to do it. So we started uh, with that. And I would say admissions, registration and scheduling. We just scheduled like three hour sessions over uh, every few days over the course of a few weeks. And man, we went through a lot of content and we only brought in you want to just bring in the people who kind of know the process, like maybe a manager and maybe a couple, one or two subject matter experts. It's just yeah. way faster. And we just really powered through that. The rest of it has really been just, it's been 
it's been an ongoing, I, I use the word journey because it's been an ongoing journey over the last 12 months and the journey is continuing. And it's just wherever you want to start, go and you know do as much as you think is necessary there. What I'm coaching people right now to do is get your critical processes done first. So do your process survey. Don't worry if you don't have them all filled in. Let's just do the critical ones first. Yeah. And that's where we start. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, hopefully, um, Denise, that helped with your question. Uh, we will collect all of these and then provide a, a written response to this as well. Um, I just want to pause there uh, and just say thank you for everyone for coming uh, and being with us today. And Nancy, thank you so, so, so much for being with us and just sharing both the view of your flows, which is fantastic, and your, your story, uh, you know, what you've been able to do with it. Thank you for all your hard work in procedure flow. It's so, so great to see you using it in that way. And, getting the benefits. So um, thank you. Thank you. We've enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you for I'll, making it. I've been I'll looking wave at you from my driveway tonight <laughs> over at your quarantine place. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day and, and uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks everybody. All right. Take care.